and that, you know, you can say whatever you want. Right. That, I'm gonna, you know, hey, I just hit record. Is that OK? <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, well, whatever you want to start it. But um, but yeah, I don't know if that actually is your position or not. You yeah, know, that we can, get, we can we can get into it. Yeah. And, you know, and but whether or not, you know, that, you know, that's what the government should do. So it's basically basically, I guess it's intellectual property, um, slander, defam slander, libel. I'm not sure if there's anything else. You know, uh, he, he probably wants me to pester you about Bitcoin, too. <laughs> now, well, he didn't mention anything about Bitcoin because that's not really about free market. I mean, you can ask me about it. I mean, I yeah, guess yeah. you like I mean, you I mean, you like Bitcoin as well. Well, yeah, but I'm not like I'm just an investor in it. I'm not really I can't say I'm a promoter because I don't know enough about. Yeah, I mean, I just don't think it, it it qualifies as money. I mean, it doesn't yeah. qualify as money in practical terms because nobody uses it as yeah. money. And I don't think it meets the criteria of money. Um, you know, and people think it can be a store of value, but I don't know what value you're storing. You know, I mean, I yeah. don't know what I don't know what yeah. what value Bitcoin has to offer that yeah. you're storing. I don't I don't see how society is any better off because we now have 19 million Bitcoin than before we had any Bitcoin. I don't know what, you know, what new, what, what we can do now that we couldn't do before. Yeah, I, I think the idea is that it's like, uh, it's definitely not money yet. Um, um, but it's like, it's like the, the same purpose gold would serve, except that it's got some advantages over gold because it's Yeah, digital. but except that gold's value comes from the fact that it's a metal that has right. all sorts of valuable properties that we right. need. Um, you can't skip over that. You can't just say, oh, we're going to be a store of value, even though we don't have any of the value to store. Like, we're just going to be we're just going to be like gold, because I've said that's like saying um, I have a digital house and it's got all the properties of a regular house. I mean, you don't even have any maintenance. It's so much better than a regular house because I don't have to maintain it. Nothing ever breaks. And it's like, yeah, but you can't live in it. It doesn't provide any shelter. Just because it's a digital representation of a house doesn't mean it's better than a house. <laughs> you know, it's like I can't, you know, I can't actually. You know, use strangely, it. I, there are some people who I just came across some guy who's got this virtual world and he li he kind of lives in it. So he actually he kind of lives in it, not physically, but he does lots of things in it. It's weird, but um, yeah, um, but I, I mean, any, but yeah. yeah, but any, but yeah, but I mean, anybody there's anybody can he can copy that digital world and and yeah. give it to as many people as he wants. Um, I guess the argument would be that you know gold gold's mm -hmm. value when it's being used as a store value and quasi monetized or when it used to be fully monetized that most of its value is not because of its industrial and jewelry uses anyway. So it's got this ninety percent value that's because of its use as a network effect of money. And Bitcoin could have that too, because well, I don't. Yeah, that's what people. That's what people claim. They think, well, most of the value is from the fact that it's money. But I don't know how you can make that conclusion. The only reason it is money is because of those other properties, and it's not like gold is not being used, right? It's not like right. okay, gold is eighteen hundred dollars an ounce, and so there's no gold being used in jewelry. Jewelers are still willing to pay eighteen hundred dollars right. an ounce to make gold jewelry. Uh, computer chip manufacturers are still willing to pay eighteen hundred dollars. If basically there was nobody using gold for anything, if nobody was willing to pay this price, and the only thing you were using it for is money, then you might make that argument. But the fact that you actually yeah. have a market at this price means that it's worth it. <laughs> so, but but yeah. but so let, but let's imagine you had like ten million dollars of your wealth in gold, and then and then all of a sudden it stopped being used completely as some kind of store of value. So you would lose ninety no, percent. It's, it, it's not going to be stopped using as a store of value unless it stopped being used as a commodity. Because let's say you actually need a store of value. What are you going to use? I mean, what big, what big commodity Bitcoin. are you going to? No, 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 but I'm saying you, no, you can't use Bitcoin because Bitcoin has no use. So you can store corn because people will eat it in the future. You can store wheat. You can store oil. You can store all sorts of things that people are going to need in the future. But there's a huge cost of storing those things. And over time, they may lose value and not be worth as much. 
in the future as they are right yeah. now. So the storing value is simply a concept of prices are going up. The prices of goods and services are going up. So I'm just going to buy goods and services today that I'm going to need in the future. Well, you know, the, the ones that you can buy the, and, 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 and not use them right away, that's what gold is great for. I can take gold and I don't have to use it. I can just store it in a coin or a bar or even in a piece of jewelry. And in the future, it can be melted down and used as a metal. Right. So that's that's what your 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 store. You don't want paper currency because it's losing value. So you have to actually buy uh, something real. But I mean, Bitcoin will only be valuable if speculators decide they want to own yeah. it. But well, how do you know what speculators are going to want in the future? I mean, it's just a pure speculation for me to say that gold is going to continue to be valued in industry and in jewelry. That's not a stretch. I mean, it, they've been using it for thousands of years. So right. why would they suddenly stop? I don't know. Right. You know, but Bitcoin but it does has have only a value, been it valued. It has a value now, $35,000. So you, you know, but Bitcoin has only been valued for a few years. Yeah, and 11 years. And how do you know yeah. it's going to be valued in a few more? I mean, people, people like Bitcoin because it's gone up. They're not going to like it so much after it goes way down. And do, there's do nothing think, to stop it from going way down. Do you think that it, something could change your mind? Like, let's say 20 years from now, it's been it's been steadily increasing and it's a million dollars a coin then. And do you think you would finally at some point say, well, I guess empirically it is being used as a store of value that's reliable and no. it's even displaced gold. Do you think anything could happen that would make you reevaluate your yeah, take on People it? ask me that a lot. And I mean, I always turn it around and I say, well, you're just making it about price. So if that's the case, is there a price to which Bitcoin could fall where you would admit that you're wrong and that, yeah. you know, it's, you know, so and, and usually they'll say, no, I'll just buy it no matter how cheap it gets. So even if Bitcoin went to a thousand or a hundred, they would just buy more. Yeah, yeah. And I'm like, you know, all right. So it, it, but yeah, price yeah. is not um, what I'm looking for. What, what I'm looking for is Bitcoin. But what if it's, ste what if it's steady and not volatile? It has to be, and it, all right, if it's going to replace gold, it can't just replace gold as a store of value. It has to replace gold as money, hmm. right? So if, if in the future, Bitcoin is a legitimate medium of exchange. So if you go into a store or online and you see goods and services yeah. priced in Satoshis, this is right. You know, a thousand satoshis. This, if you right. see, if people go to get jobs and they say we're looking for a new executive vice president, you know, the salary is, uh, you know, a half a bitcoin a year or whatever, whatever it is, or you know, this is, you know, there's an active bond market for bitcoins. People are financing, uh, they're borrowing bitcoins and repaying bitcoins. People are buying life insurance policies where they pay the premium in you know bitcoin and the death benefit is in in bitcoin you know where it's actually a medium of exchange prices contracts bonds yeah you know, all this stuff so that Unit bitcoin account, right because people say to me well but no one's doing that with gold not now they were all of that was in gold before we started mm -hmm. pricing it in, in right. fiat so if bitcoin can achieve that type of success where people are confident right. enough in its future value to loan out money for 30 years or to buy a life insurance policy where the death benefit is going to be Bitcoin, where people, where, where landlords will sign rents, long-term rental contracts, right? Where the rent is in Bitcoin, right? I mean, yeah. right now, there are a few people that say, oh, we pay, you know, I, I pay my employees in Bitcoin. Well, their salary isn't in Bitcoin. They just do a conversion. Let's right. say I'm hiring somebody and they're making, you know, a thousand dollars a week and I pay them every two weeks. So now I owe them two thousand dollars. I just figure out how much Bitcoin I can buy for two thousand. Right. And that's what I so that's yeah. not really being paid in Bitcoin. Being paid in Bitcoin is I you're going to get the same quantity, you know, and I, I don't see, you know, if all that actually happens, well, then. Um, yeah, I guess, you know, you can say, I guess it works. 
Um, but if all people do with Bitcoin is hold on to it, to speculate on appreciation, if that's all it's used for, then if the bubble ends up getting that big, you know, I'm not going to admit that I'm wrong. I will be surprised if Bitcoin got to a million. Right. Look, you know, you, we have yeah. an example of what just happened. And, you know, with, with, with stocks like GameStop, where GameStop went from, you know, 10 bucks to 500, whatever it was, you know, as we're recording this, mm -hmm. it's back to around 100. So I don't know if the bubble is completely popped for good. It kind of looks like it has, and it's probably going to make the round trip. But there are a lot of people who are arguing, well, why can't GameStop just go up indefinitely? You know? Yeah. And, you know, so this was a compressed version of Bitcoin because, you know, with GameStop, it was easier for people to say, well, but the company can't possibly be worth this. Right. Uh, they can't possibly make enough money to ever justify this valuation. Right. Uh, but, you know, in the short run, people will ignore valuation and just focus on price. Hey, the price is going up uh, yeah. and I want to buy it because somebody else is going to pay a higher price. That is what's going on with Bitcoin. You know, you have to ignore the, the fundamentals and just focus on, hey, Bitcoin is the best performing asset over the last 10 years. Yes, I'm not arguing about that. Yes, it, but that doesn't mean that it's going to be the best performing asset over the next 10 years. That doesn't mean that it has any yeah, real I, value I yep. simply means that people have been willing to buy it and, and, and pay much higher prices. Yeah. But I also don't know how much manipulation is going in behind the scenes. There's a lot of accusations of a lot of fraud going on. I know that once people have a stake in Bitcoin, they have a powerful incentive to pump it up, just like the people who bought into GameStop real cheap had an incentive to pump it up so they can dump it. Because the dynamic of Bitcoin is the same as any Ponzi or pyramid or chain letter. It all depends on new money coming in. You need a constant supply of new people who decide to buy. That's the only way the price is going to go up. And a lot of people try why, to... Um, hmm? Do you think that's why Saylor, Michael Saylor is having that conference tomorrow, this open to the world on Zoom, um, where he's trying yeah. to tell other CEOs why they can uh, put their put their cash into uh, Bitcoin instead of Treasury, so that the price goes up and his his previous bet does better. Well, absolutely. The more CEOs he can sucker into Bitcoin, to the extent that it pushes up the price of Bitcoin, then it pushes up the value of their company. Because now a lot of their earnings are going to be derived from the, the the rising price of Bitcoin because they're sitting on so many Bitcoin. And his stock now is almost a proxy for Bitcoin. It's becoming yep. a Bitcoin ETF, ETF yep. Yep. other than a software company. And I think what he's basically trying to say to corporate CEOs is, hey, this is a way to cheat. Because if you just buy this, it's going to go up as other people buy it. And your earnings are going to be inflated because you put a bunch of cash. Because his thesis that corporations should convert their cash to Bitcoin as a hedge against inflation because you know there's a potential for a 2% a year inflation right. or 3%. Right. That is nonsense. Why I mean you Bitcoin is so much riskier than any fiat currency. I mean it could easily drop by 50%. How can you buy that as a hedge when yeah. you can easily buy gold? I mean if you don't like dollars you can buy Swiss francs, you can buy, you know, other currencies, but if you don't want any fiat currencies, you can easily own gold as yeah. currency. And, you know, or if you don't have a productive use for your cash, pay it out to your shareholders in dividends and let them decide what they're going to do with it. But if you just have all this cash, and you don't have anything to do with it. I mean, putting it into Bitcoin is complete nonsense. But, you know, he did it, and now he has to make sure that other people do it. Uh, but I don't think a lot of corporate CEOs are actually going to bite on this. I mean, it, 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 it's a very small number of institutions that are actually that are actually doing this. But of course, the media is playing it up and acting as if there's this whole movement of institutions and companies into Bitcoin when it's just not happening. You know, in fact, I think fewer merchants are working with Bitcoin now than a few years ago. I mean, they tried it and they quickly phased it out. So it never really grew. And then all the Bitcoin proponents, you know, just kind of like, OK, forget about that. Yeah, it's never going to be used as money. It doesn't work as a medium, but it's going to be digital gold. 
Well, it's not digital gold because it doesn't do anything that real gold does. I mean, it's just all a made up narrative to try to pretend that gold is worthless. That's what these Bitcoin guys think. They think gold has no value, that it's all, it's all because people just believe it has value and that people will stop believing and gold's just gonna be a worthless rock. That you're gonna see gold on the ground and you'll just kick it because it's so worthless. They think gold has no value whatsoever and it's all in our minds. And, 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 there, and therefore Bitcoin is, is superior in every way to gold. I mean, it's completely laughable the things that people have to believe in order to accept uh, the Bitcoin narrative. Did I lose you? Self, uh, no. Hello? I'm here. Can you hear me? Yeah. Can you hear me? Now I can, yeah. Yeah, I, I think I think your test is makes sense. If it starts being used as a, as a unit of account and uh, like a cl it's a closed system where you don't have to – Tra transfer back to dollars and all that, uh, then that would be, you might have to reevaluate. And, and who knows, that could happen in, in the next 10 years or 15 yeah, and years. Look, but that's what a lot of these true believers think is going to happen. Yeah. Because if it doesn't happen, you have all these people that have Bitcoin, right? And let's say you've been hodling it for years and years, and you know you have this huge on paper wealth in Bitcoin, right? But you haven't actually bought anything. You're still driving the same old car. You're living in the same old apartment. You know, you haven't updated your wardrobe. You haven't taken a vacation because you didn't want to sell any of your Bitcoin because, you know, they were going to go up so much. But let's yeah. say Bitcoin finally reaches a level where you're kind of satisfied, where, yeah. OK, you know, this is kind of the peak. This is where it's going it's to level plateaued. Off, It's right? plateaued. Yeah. Now. I want to start buying stuff. I'm a millionaire now. I, I want to start living like one. I want a right. nice car. I want a new house. Well, you and a lot of other people are going to kind of come to the same conclusion at the same time. We all want this stuff. Well, if you want to buy a house and the guy who's selling it doesn't want Bitcoin, you want to buy a new car, but the, the car dealership doesn't want Bitcoin. You know, the car dealership wants dollars. So it is the seller of your house. And in fact, when you sell your Bitcoin, the U.S. government wants to be paid taxes on the gains. And they don't want Bitcoin either. Yeah. They want U.S. dollars. So all of a sudden, all the people that have Bitcoin need U.S. dollars to buy all the things they want and to pay all the taxes on their gains. Who is going to buy all those Bitcoin from them? <laughs> That's the problem. So, Well, I, I guess the idea is if, if, it, if it plateaus at a million bucks or whatever – by that point, it's in such wide use that people would want the Bitcoins instead of the dollars. No, no, no. It doesn't have to be in any wider use than it is now. Look, Bitcoin went from pennies of Bitcoin to 30,000, and no one's using it for anything. So it could go to a million right. in, under the same circumstances. Nobody actually has to use it. And it doesn't have to be any more widely adopted than it is now. It's just if everybody who owns their Bitcoin today just decides they're not going to sell any, right? You know, it, it just takes a tiny transaction to, to print a million, right? As long as all the sellers say, we won't sell unless it's a million. And then one guy's like, okay, I'll sell my Bitcoin for a million. Now, all of a sudden, they're all worth a million, even though just one traded there, right? That's you know, right. So right. It, doesn't, it doesn't matter how many people. My point is, I don't think it's ever going to grow to the point uh, where you'll be able to buy all the things you want with your Bitcoin from sellers who will be content to accept your Bitcoin. I think in order to actually tap into your Bitcoin wealth, you're going to have to sell the Bitcoin and find a new buyer. And my point is, there won't be any new buyers. <laughs> the market will implode. Yeah, I know. But but you, and it, the, the government thing is a problem, but uh, that's not an economic argument against it. I mean, the, the government can hamper it with their tax regime and with their monopoly over the Fed. But oh yeah, I'm could, not in favor. Yeah, I'm not in yeah, favor of yeah. the income tax or the capital gains tax. In fact, I live in Puerto Rico, so to the extent that I actually owned any Bitcoin, which I don't, I could sell mine tax free, so I wouldn't have that impediment. But you know, the majority of people who own Bitcoin are going to be in a situation where they have a tax liability if they sell at a profit, and they're going to need dollars or euros or whatever currency they're taxed in. I mean, that's one of the reasons that fiat currency works, right? Because yes, the US dollar is intrinsically worthless, right? Just like Bitcoin, right? It's not gold. 
Uh, but what gives it value, other than confidence that people have in it, is the fact that the U.S. government requires every American citizen to yeah. remit their tax payments in dollars. And so everybody needs right. dollars in order to stay out of jail. So there's always going to be a demand for dollars because you always have to pay your taxes. Uh, unless you live in Puerto Rico. But you know, even here we have some. But the point is that that creates some demand. Like if the U.S. government said, you know what, from now on, you know, we're going to accept our tax payments in peach pits. Right. That's what we want. We're only going to take peach pits. Well, then everybody would have to start accumulating peach pits because that's what the government claims they want, uh, you know, for their taxes. So once the government says it. So if the government were to say, look, we only want Bitcoin. That's you got to pay your tax in Bitcoin. Well, now I would actually need some Bitcoin right now. Nobody needs Bitcoin. People need gold. Jewelers need gold. Computer chip manufacturers need gold. The, you know, the aerospace industry needs gold. Dentists need gold. So there's all these people who need gold and will buy it regardless of the price. Nobody needs Bitcoin. People will buy it if they think the price is going to go up, but they don't need it. And I don't um, need it to pay taxes. By the way, I know some libertarian friends who've been moving to Saipan, kind of doing your Puerto Rico thing, but in Saipan, because there's a great tax deal there too. Nor the Northern uh, Mar uh, Mariana Islands and the person. I think it's uh, like it's a negotiated. I don't know. Maybe they have, maybe they've passed something recently that's kind of like what Puerto Rico did. Because I was familiar with the law that they had in um, the in the U.S. Virgin Islands. And there, each person that moved there um, negotiated their own tax deal independently. It was now, this, is, this is like you move there and you just declare your residency and you get the IRS to approve it and you have to be there more than 50% of the time over a three-year period. Yeah. And then you – so then you're subject to Saipan taxes and not U.S. taxes. Exactly. And, yeah, that's and the same then, in Puerto Rico. And, but then they give you a nine, up to a 90% rebate on what you pay if you're an American citizen. On what you pay where? To Saipan. So like let's oh, say you, you pay the regular So your, what is your, what is pay. the regular what is the regular Saipan tax? I, I don't I think it's comparable to the US tax, maybe a little bit less, but let's say you pay 40% here, you pay 40% in Saipan, but then you get 90% of that back as a refund in Saipan. Right. So then, you, so then you get yeah that well so, in so you're Puerto paying Rico, you're paying ten percent of what you pay here basically in yeah, taxes. Yeah, Puerto Rico is actually still better because my tax in Puerto Rico on the the income that I earn from operating my business is four percent. Mm -hmm. So that's pretty much you know like ten percent of what I would pay in the U.S. Right, four percent tax yeah, versus yeah. four, and it's right. actually lower because you know you have state taxes that get added on depending on where you live. I was in Connecticut. But my capital yeah. gains tax rate is zero. So that's 100% yeah, it's rebate. It's the same, same for Saipan, I believe. Oh, I think so it's it the sounds same like then it's about the same. Because you're not subject to U.S. capital gains. Yeah, but that sounds like it's about the same then. 90% rebate on your income probably gets you into about a 4% tax bracket. So, yeah. but yeah, I, don't, you know, I don't know if okay, it's Okay, well, as, um, you want to... Yeah. I mean, obviously, I could look into that if Puerto Rico becomes a state, but I don't know if it's as nice a place to live for, you know, for the family, for my kids. You know, I've never uh, even it's, been there. It's apparently a pretty island. with a, It's got like 50,000 people. It's close to China and Korea and all that. So I don't know much yeah, about but it's it. A lot, but, uh, it's a lot further away from here, you know, um, from, the, from the U.S., the mainland. True. Um, well, do you want to talk about the other stuff? I mean, yeah, uh, yeah. That's, I, well, I that's, kinda, why, I, that's why I, I'm, I'm here. In, I'm in. I'm in <laughs> <laughs> well, let's do it. <laughs> I'm kind of impressed by your uh, by you as a dad because I have a precocious 17 uh, year old who is libertarian, but he doesn't agree with me on everything. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, Spencer has uh, gone, you know, way over to the anarcho capitalist side of it, um, kind of like, you know, anarchy, no government at all. Yeah, and that that's what I am. But I but so I have a position on IP, intellectual property. You and I talked about it before privately, but. Um, I guess he wanted me to try to chat with you and explain my case to you and see if I can just make sure you understand it and then see if you poke any holes in it. But um, so my case against IP is not – and defamation law too, by the way, which is related um, – is not based upon – you don't have to be an anarchist. 
it's it, basically it, it it's based upon an understanding of what property rights are and what free markets are. And I think you and I are agreed on on that. I mean, you're in favor of private property rights and free markets and minimal government or something like that, right? So we're on the same page. With yeah, that. I mean, that's the 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 main reason that I want government. And again, I think like you know, in some type of uh, idealistic uh, world, uh, maybe you could have no government at all. But I just don't think that that's practical because I do think that, you know, having no government at all is kind of like a vacuum and, and it's going to be filled with something. And so kind of like preemptively to prevent a worse government from forming, let's preemptively create one and make right, sure that it's right. very limited yeah. in its power. Right. And the, the main purpose of government is to protect private property, which would include your life, your liberty, and things like that. But that's why we institute government. And we basically, we instead of each one of us acting as our own policemen, uh, we collectively come together right. and we, we give the government some of our power to use right. force in a uh, defensive manner uh, to a, a central government uh, that is charged with, with that responsibility. Yeah, uh, but, but we're I supposed think, to we're supposed to be freer because we have government because uh, the government is protecting our property so that we don't have to do it ourselves yeah. and now we can you know we can right. operate under the assumption that there's these laws are protecting us right but the case against defamation law and, and intellectual property you don't have to, it's not based upon anarchy so you, if you're basically in favor of private property rights and innovation and prosperity and freedom and uh, capitalism and the free market that's enough to explain why IP law is incompatible with those things, I believe. Yeah, and you think it, IP would include any kind of patent or, or copyright or a, anything that you yeah. invent yeah. Is, you, is pretty much fair yeah. game. You don't own, you don't have any kind of proprietary interest in anything well, that you create. Well, let, let me – so let me just explain. So – and I'm a patent lawyer too, by the way, so I understand the system well. I've gotten lots of patents okay. for lots of companies. Um, um, there, there are kind of two types of arguments for these things. One is the, sort of the consequentialist or empirical or utilitarian argument like, oh, we need to incentivize inventors and, and artists. Um, and then there's the more natural yeah. natural rights or property type argument that, oh, you created that, so you have a property right in it. And there – both of those arguments are flawed, but they're, they have to be responded to differently. So the empirical mm -hmm. argument requires studies and all that, which we can't get into. I, I have studies on my website, and we could talk about it a little bit, but I don't know what your case is. Is it more practical, like you need this, the government needs to come in and well, give temporary I mean, monopolies to incentivize people, or is it a rights argument in your, in your point of view? Well, I mean, first of all, right? in the United States, it's one of the few things that the federal government is authorized to do. You go back to the Constitution, and the U.S. government has, you know, is authorized to issue— it, it's, uh, it's, it's definitely—well, patents are definitely constitutional. I would argue co copyright is unconstitutional because um, the Constitution authorized patent and copyright in the 1789 Constitution— but the Bill of Rights was enacted two years later in 1791, and the First Amendment is clearly incompatible with copyright because uh, freedom of the press is guaranteed by the First Amendment. So Congress cannot restrict freedom of the press, but copyright law prevents you from publishing books, which is a restriction on freedom of the press. Yeah, so I, I mean, would say, I would not make that argument because, again, I mean, you know, the the example of look, I have freedom of speech, but I can't yell, you know, fire in a crowded room. So, I mean, I don't think, you know, your, your uh, freedom of speech is absolute in the sense that you have the right to slander me or, you know, uh, things like that, or, you know, it's not an absolute. I mean, what I do think is an abridgment of the freedom of speech, as I think, or the freedom of the press, is the fact that there's sales taxes on books and newspapers. Yes. I, think, I think those taxes are unconstitutional because they actually abridge freedom of the press and freedom of speech because they well, Peter copy, copyright restricts that kind of freedom way worse than the sales tax does. <laughs> I well know because again um, the Supreme Court has recognized this but they even say that the Supreme Court says that 
uh, there's a tension in the law between copyright and the, and the First Amendment. But what they do is they try to balance it because they think that they're both in the Constitution, so they have to reconcile these irreconcilable provisions. But my argument is that the, the First Amendment came two years later, and it therefore repealed the copyright clause. No, I just think like if, the, it was, just like, if it was their intention to do that, then that's what they would have done. Uh, I don't think – I don't think uh, that was the case. And, and clearly, if you go back to uh, the time of the framers and the people who were around, I'm sure there might have been, I mean, there were patents or copyrights that were issued while all the people who wrote that amendment were still alive. And so, you know, if, if, well, if they true. had meant to exclude that, they would have, they we, would have done something. Well, we, we also had official state religions in Massachusetts and other states at, in 1791, and now, now people think that the First Amendment prohibits that, which I don't agree with. Yeah, well, again, I, I don't. People, people are now changing the meaning of the Constitution under the guise of interpreting it, and that's a whole different well, they discussion. Well, they applied it to the states with the 14th Amendment, which I think is, is, is erroneous, but, uh, but anyway, the point is… Just because patent and copyright are authorized by the Constitution doesn't mean that that, a liber that they're justified by libertarian principles. Right, I mean, but let's say – look, let's go back to – so I, I, I've authored several books, right? Yeah, And too. so if I'm going to write a book yeah, and I'm going to spend a lot of time writing yeah. it, yeah. Right? And, um, and, 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 and the way I'm going to be repaid for writing the book – is by selling the finished product, right? You mean if that's what I you want to do? That's what you want to do. Well, right. That's what I'm going to do. I'm, I'm, but, but if I don't have some exclusive right for some period of time to sell what I've written, the minute I write something, anybody is free to just say, oh, Peter just wrote a new book. Let's copy the whole thing. And we didn't spend any time. We don't have any fixed costs. We can sell the book exactly the same, even cheaper. Right. And um, and then, you know, that that's not fair to just sit back and just wait for somebody else to do all the hard work. Why? And and now you're going to you know, you're going to sell the book. So, so your argument, you don't have a principled argument. Your argument's empirical. So it's, no, so no, it's but it's all principle that I have a right to the fruits of my labor and my Why? investment and my sacrifice that that. I, I have created this original work of fiction or nonfiction, right. whatever it is, but it didn't exist. I created it myself, right. and so, I should okay. have some right to my intellectual property that right. I created and so, be able so, to get a return. Yeah. And yes, I mean, because I think if you don't have that right, then yes, there you won't have the incentive to invent things and create things. Okay. If other people can just post whatever you've done – and they have as much right to profit from it as you do, and they did none of the work, made none of the investments. But so you're mixing you're mixing the arguments together then. So you're saying it's a right because you created it. So let, let's just focus on that for a second. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, how would you distinguish that from just normal free market competition? Well, what do you mean? And so I come up with so let's say that. Well, let, let's say that there's no such thing as uh, as uh, uh, there's pizza shops, but there's no such thing as, as as home delivery, and so Domino's, I don't remember who was the first. Pizza Hut says um, we're going to start delivering pizza to people's houses. It's a new business model, and it's very popular. So they can charge a lot of money for it at first, but all of a sudden Domino's is going to say, "Hey, I can get in on this game too." So Domino's sees what other people did. They learn from your example. They can yeah, they emulate what you did, and they yeah, and all of a sudden. But you know, as a patent lawyer, there's no way you're going to be able to patent we're going to deliver the pizza. I mean, there's no invention there. That's just a, you know, a different way of, uh, of, of actually, serving. Actually, business, business methods have been patented, but that, that but my not, point not, is not – You're that. not going to get a patent on – okay, let's, decide, let's, just, let's say I just decide that I'm going to have home delivery of a different product, not pizzas, whatever. I'm, I got a new business and my model is to deliver it. Just like all these companies that started selling stuff on the internet. Like when Amazon said, hey, we're going to sell books on the internet, they, they, don't, they couldn't get a patent on selling books on the internet. They couldn't stop anybody else from selling their books Actually, online. Actually, Amazon got a patent on, on purchasing a book with one click. I mean – but well, that's I the don't point. know what technology they had to invent to enable that, but it would have been <laughs> a, it you. would have been a patent on the, the programming or what nope. they did. Not not nope. the, it's not wrong. Well, there's so many other booksellers. No way, but there are plenty of people selling books online, not just Amazon. Well, that was 
<laughs> the patents only last 17 years, so finally people well, could compete. But well, the, the I, point I think I, I remember buying stuff from Barnes and Noble online and other stores. You know, not with one, not with one click. For, there was about a five-year period you couldn't do it with one click because Amazon had the exclusive right to do it with. You well, there must have been clicks. something unique about the software that they developed. No, that did. No, the it. patent office is no, the patent office is incompetent, and the the standards are vague and arbitrary. But my point is, my point is. You're not if, – if you do something new, people will learn from it, and they will emulate that, and they will compete with you. When they start competing, they will they will lower the price you can charge initially because you're the first mover. You understand, You agree with that, right? Just yeah, on look, the free market I, I did, in general. I, I, look, if I just come up with a different way of doing something where I haven't had to invent – you know, a, 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 a new product, a new, a new thing that now somebody else would have to utilize that invention, um, then there's no patent there. But look, go back to my example, because it's very easy, of the book that I wrote. I, I organize these words in a, in a particular manner, and now I'm publishing my book, right? Why does somebody else have a right to copy word for word everything that I wrote? And then sell that book without because having to made go it through public. my publisher. But because because you made it, you made the information public, and you took the risk that people will compete. But with I made what it. Did. But I made it public to people who bought it for the excuse. No, you for made their it public to the, what, if, That's not how information works. Inf uh, the people that you sold it to, you could have a contract with them, and you can say, "I'm selling you this book, and you have to sign an agreement with me that you can't copy it." That's fine. You can have a contract. Well, they but can't that's not sell what copyright it. is. People, that's what there's copyrights on every book. It says that. I mean, look, you know, it's like it's like the thing, you know, when you go to watch a video at home, and the, the first yep. thing it says is copying this video, it's punishable, this is under patent, it's yeah. all you know, they don't care if you copy it and for yourself. They they don't want other people selling it for money and eating into their market that way. They don't really, I mean, they're not going to go after somebody who just makes their own copy for private, you know, non-commercial use, even though, I mean, technically maybe that is a violation, uh, but it's there. I mean, every, all the books, this is copyright material. Um, you know, so that contract is there. You're buying my book and you're agreeing that you bought this copy of my book. You didn't buy it so that you can just make hundreds and hundreds of copies and then go sell them. So do you think you should be able to copy the Bible or well, Romeo the Bible is out of look. Copyrights don't last forever. The Bible right. is a, is very so very if, old. If, but if it's a property right, if it's a property right, why should it expire? I mean, property rights last forever. Well, because you know the you know the author is not going to be around forever. But you know, I mean, you could say, well, it goes to their children, and it does yeah. for a certain amount of time. But look, I, I, look, it's like there is a reasonable period of time that I guess government, we can establish a society where you have a reasonable amount of time for you to recoup your investment and profit from your, your labor and, and, and what you've done but, but, versus but they've never, uh, you know, opening but it they've up never to done society that. They've never done these studies, Peter. Hmm? It's just arbitrary. I mean, you know, the well, original I agree that it's arbitrary. Years, and now it's like a I agree that it's an arbitrary number, and maybe you can argue as to what is the proper number of years that it should apply. I do. It should be zero. It should but be zero. But again, if you're making it zero, I, 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 I don't think that that's going to lead to a more vibrant free market. If you're going to tell somebody that their intellectual but now you're property making, you're not has making, no but, value. But that's not a natural. <laughs> okay, but that's not a natural rights argument. Now you're saying what it will lead to. I mean, listen. I think the the mistake you and others make. You're kind of like a Randian, and are you you have this Lockean idea that if you create something, you should own. It. And I think that's the fundamental mistake. Creation. Well, that you're saying that anything I create should be on social, wealth. should be distributed equally. So you want to redistribute no. my creative efforts, you know, to the public. No, in I'm, general. I'm saying that the, the purpose of property rights is that we live in a world of scarcity, right? And there are certain things that are in limited supply, and only one person can use these things. And so we have property rights to allow people to live without conflict, right? So your car, your land, your body. All these things can only be used by one person at a time, and so mm -hmm. property rights say who owns it, and according to the Western tradition that you and I agree with, the rights are determined in accordance with two very simple rules. The first person who started using this thing in the, in the, in the, in the state of 
in state of nature like the homesteader or the person who got it by contract from a previous owner. That's it. Creation has nothing to do with it. So creation or productivity just means rearranging the things that you own already, the factors of production. Right. So like if you if you own some metal and you reshape it into a, a plow, now you increased your wealth, right? By using your knowledge and your effort and your labor, you've made yourself more wealthy. You have a more valuable thing. But you don't own something new. You own the plow because you own the metal that went into it. Right? Yeah, I like so I creation is not a source of I understand the distinction that you're making between a physical piece of property that only one person can own at a time versus you know an idea that can be shared or you know just a formula for making something or a design yeah. or because i have a book yes those words can be reproduced you know millions of times yes, over and exactly i haven't lost i i get that but what i have lost is my right to profit but you don't have a my, right well but if i so you don't have a right to. Well, who says I don't? The, the I, I, I customers, lost. But they. Can you hear me now? Yeah, but I think society, what you're saying is government, you know, we've taken government. And we said, OK, we're going to protect the rights of inventors and, you know, authors, uh, you know, to what they invent. We're going to incentivize them. Um, with these with these laws to protect that property. I mean, if you want to say, hey, let's not recognize this right. If 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 we as a society want to decide, okay, there's no private property. I mean, there's no intellectual property. And those are the rules of the game. Yeah. You know, then we can see what happens. Because I don't think because if somebody has already invested all this money based on the rules of hey, you're going to get protected. You do have property rights in your intellectual property. And they've already made the investment. If you're going to change that, that's like you're taking property without compensation. Oh. But I think well, if Peter, you want I mean, to go, if you want to go like going forward, hey, but, anything you do going forward, you can't patent, you can't right. copyright. And we all agree that those are the rules. And therefore, you know, I don't, you know, society may invent other ways of trying to get around that. But like, yeah, there's but no the, way that companies are going to invest in, you know, coming up Peter, with a new drug if there's no way they're going to be able to profit from all the money they have to spend on researching and developing it, you know. OK, but but, but you're not a pure Democrat or populist or, or, or legal positivist. I mean, we're arguing about what the law should be. I mean, I assume you're against the Social Security system, right? Even though some people are counting on it right now. But well, I, I, well, a you and I think the Social Security system shouldn't shouldn't exist, right? It's well, unjust. It's not constitutional, and it's it's organized as a Ponzi scheme. I mean, why you know for the government to force people into a Ponzi scheme? Obviously, it's immoral as well as illegal, and it's it's bad. It's bad policy. It's 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 bad. Uh, you know. It, well, it encourages uh, all the But wrong aside things. from all it's that, a, it's no. But, it's but, got it's, but aside from rights. all that, the fundamental problem with it, it's theft. It is right. Yes. Because Social Security is, is a theft of property from me to old people right now. We, are, we, we agree with that. I, I, I'm just saying that there is theft of intellectual property. You're just coming from no, the no, perspective no, no, no. Is not. that I it's can't not. own. And also, and again, you, you don't think there's any value to goodwill or reputation. That's why no, you there, think there's that value. There's value, but you can't own everything that has, that has a value. Just because no, something is value like doesn't saying, mean so, it's property. Well, yeah, it, it is property on a balance sheet. I mean, when you're looking at corporation and there's a value assigned to goodwill. That's fine. In That's any fine. Kind of business. Repu right? rep reputation is value. valuable. Reputation is valuable. Right. And that's what Look, it comes I, down to. So, but, value but my wife. My I think child, I keep, I'm losing you. Love to be right in it. Hmm? Let me take this headphone off. Hold on. But, but your, what your position is is that my business competitors are should be allowed to deliberately um, put out false information to malign my reputation um, and hurt my business, and I would have no recourse. Well, that's uh, against, a defamation argument. Hold on. That's hmm? a de I mean, yeah, no, but I you, thought that's kind of the similar. You don't you make that same argument? 
that I don't well, own my reputation. Therefore, I have, you know, anybody, anybody can destroy it if they want to with by lying because it's freedom well, this of speech. Is a, this is a well-known, I mean, I don't know if you've read Rothbard and Walter Block. I mean, this is a well-known argument. Libertarians almost universally agree that defamation law is totally unjustified. You can't own your reputation because you don't you don't own what other people think about you because they're that's, not your slaves. That's true. But if I, well, do you believe that fraud should be a crime or should fraud be legal as freedom of speech? Fraud is a type of theft by trick. So, yes, Right. Fraud well, so. Right. And, and so if I am in competition with you and yeah. I defraud your customers by putting out false information to scare them. Uh, away from doing business with you, right? That's By, not defrauding. And I'm doing that. Lying, lying is not defrauding. So if well, if, sure if, it is. I, no, if, if I if defraud my your customers, I have to take something from them of value. No, no, no. If I say something that's not true, yes, deliberately, that's, that's because I know that it's going to alter your behavior and it's going to get you to do something that you otherwise would not do if you that's knew the perfectly, truth. That's perfectly legitimate because people have the right to rely upon whatever information they want. Yeah, and then that means, yeah, and you think, I guess I right now we're, they're talking about the big pump and dump scheme. So you would think that that should be legal too. You should be able to. Well, I think, I think even Ponzi schemes should be legal. Yeah, I'm against insider trading laws and all that. Of course, I'm a libertarian. Well, the insider I'm trading laws I'm against for different reasons than that, but that's not fraud. I mean, I actually think we'd be better off without insider trading laws. Um, but as far as deliberate fraud, you know, you know, I mean, what you're saying is it's fine for somebody on a, on a car dealership to roll back the odometer and tell somebody, yeah, this car's only got 5,000 miles on it when it's got, you know, 100,000 no, miles on it. No, that, that, would be, that would be illegal, but- Well, why, why is that illegal? Well, hold on a second. The point you just is- You said lying are... is okay. Lying per se is okay. Lying, lying per se is not sufficient to have a cause of action. But if you use it to obtain a p property by deceit, then well, that that's is, what that, I'm. Well, that, that's what that's what that's what I'm. That's what a lot of defamation or slander libel is all about. No, because it, if that was the case, you could just rely upon fraud law. In other words, if we already have fraud law and contract law, which we do, why do you need an extra law called defamation or trademark or patent or copyright? They have to add something extra in addition to fraud. I don't know. I mean, if they just want to, if they want to incorporate it into the general laws against fraud, I mean, they're just kind of making them more specific. But but, but, but they have. But, but, trust me, everyone that favors defamation law would oppose what you're saying because they know it would end defamation law. Um, you when you accuse someone of defamation, you do not have to prove fraud. You only have to prove that you said something false that harms someone's reputation. That's not fraudulent. No, no. I'm not talking about that. No, you have to prove that they knew it was false. There's malice involved. Like you, yeah, you but, know, you, but it's still not fraud. Just because you know you're saying something false does not mean that it's a fraud. Well, no, if you if you if you know it's false and you say it anyway, and if you if you hide information uh, that if you disclosed, uh, you know, then the the people would have a, a different uh, you know opinion. So if you deliberately slant a story in a way that you create a, a false impression knowingly, right? Yeah. And you're just doing that just because either you're trying to damage a competitor yes. or just because you're trying to sell more newspapers or get more views. Yep. And so you're saying stuff that you think, oh, we're going to be able to generate a lot of views if we you know, lie about this business or this person. And in so doing, you damage their reputation or damage their but, business. So who, who are you? Who are you? Who are you? Are you saying you're defrauding your competitor or are you defrauding customers? Well, you're. You know, you're. You're defrauding the, the, the potential customers of that business, or you're what do you take? What do you take? What do you take? Uh, their the reputation. And you, you may be impeding the their their ability to do business because you 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 are falsely maligning uh, their reputation. Um, there, I mean, there's a lot of damage that you could do. Look, if what you're saying is true, fine, you know, okay. Or, you know, if, you know, um, like I agree, I don't think, I don't think blackmail should be a crime, right? I mean, well, then, there, you know, but, the, but defamation is just, but extortion, similar... extortion should be a crime. If, if I, I say, you. you know, but if I, if I have, if I have pictures of you and another woman and I say, Hey, I got these pictures you know, give me $10,000 or I'm going to put them on the internet, you know, that's, that should be legal because you have yeah. a choice. 
you know. Now, if you if I if I take your ten thousand dollars and you put them on the internet anyway, well then I should. That's a crime. No, it's not a crime. It's not a crime. Bro- it's it's contract breach. It's not a crime. Yeah. Contract- well, I mean, not a crime, but you broke. You know, I you know you violated a contract. But yeah. Well, that's the same thing. Uh, Defamation is not a crime. Is we're not talking about a criminal offense. We're not talking about somebody going to jail. We're just talking about holding somebody responsible for the damages that they caused. That's all we're talking about. We're not well, talking uh, about putting people in jail. Cop- we're copyright talking about financial liability here. Copyright infringement actually is a criminal offense. Really? Yeah. Don't, I, you ever heard of? Don't you remember Aaron Swartz, the guy that committed suicide because he was facing thirty-five years in federal prison for up for, for downloading some academic articles from JSTOR? Well, the guy that, I I I did not think that it is a crime and I don't think it should be a crime because I think that the damages are monetary. We're talking about uh, a, a financial loss. Um, but you don't even have to prove that, but there's statutory damages. It says if you yeah. copy someone's work, then there's $75,000 or whatever per offense. That's it. Yeah. Although, you know, I mean, again, I mean, Individuals can't prosecute other individuals for crimes, only for only for torts, right? Only for civil damages. Only the government can say you've committed a crime. Yeah, and they right? do. They, they put yeah, the, yeah, people. But, people have gone to prison for for copying books and movies and things like that. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's. I mean, I mean, I, and I guess look, if a government look, I mean, yeah, the government, you know, can prosecute somebody. For shoplifting too, so I mean, they, they, you know, they that you're taking something that's but, not yours. Yeah, but what are you um, taking that's not yours if you copy a book? Well, you, you're basically taking away my intellectual property, and and you're infringing on you know my ability to profit. But I, I you know, I agree that it's I wouldn't look at it as the same thing as you know you breaking into my house and, and you know and taking my television set and and and, and, and except if i it. take your television you don't have it anymore i understand if i copy, if I copy right. your book you still have your book right that's why that might be a crime breaking and entering and grand theft or whatever the television is worth maybe it's not grand theft anymore televisions are so cheap but um but i think the copyright violations and the defamation and these things should be civil. I'm not arguing that they that these that these should be crimes. But they are. Uh, but you know. But I do I well, do think that that the people should be liable because you know, um, and, and it, 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 let me try the word I'm looking for. But I mean, I I know the the argument of the free market is you know oh well let let people just go out there and and say whatever they want. And, um, you know, well, people, are, people, the, people will know that since there's no libel laws, well, yep. ev- people are you know, likely to lie because yep. they know there's no consequence. So nobody exactly. believes anything that anybody says. Exactly. Um, you know, I don't know. I mean, I mean, and there might the, be ways for to judge the, the credibility of well, how these guys, lie, you know, lied before. But the but the bigger issue. Uh, look, so remember when the iPhone came out? Remember Blackberries were the popular thing before that, right? Um, and there was really no such thing as a smartphone before that. So yeah, then, I used to have a BlackBerry, and now I have an, an iPhone. Yes, so yeah, I'm so, an example. So, so Steve Jobs, they came out with the iPhone, which was no keys, a touch screen, connected to the internet. You could have apps, and so the smartphone was invented. Mm-hmm. And Apple had patents on even the shape of it, like having rounded corners and all that stuff. So for years. Uh, they they stop competitors and they still keep stop competitors because mm-hmm. the big the big guys can fight with each other with their arsenals of patents. But now little guys couldn't make a similar device because they would be sued into oblivion by these patents. So the patents basically restrict competition, cause oligopolies and cartels, reduce innovation, harm consumers, raise prices. I mean, there's literally nothing good about it. Why shouldn't people be able to compete and say, hey? Apple made a rectangular touchscreen smartphone. I'm going to make one too. What's wrong with that? Well, I don't know that they had a patent on the shape of a rectangle. They did. They did. They had a, des- a design patent on a, a But there must have been more to the patent than just no, the shape. No, there's not. This is the problem with it. It was a, 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 a it was a design patent on the way it looked, rounded corners. That's it. Well, if you want to get into an argument as to whether or not they are too liberal in what they will allow you to patent, I might not have an argument with you there. 
it, you know, to say that we're going to have a patent on this thing being a rectangle, they didn't invent the rectangle and they didn't invent the, the, a cell phone. So I don't think that is unique enough. I don't think that is, you know, something that should be patentable. You know, it's, you know, um, so yeah, there's certainly uh, an argument about the degree and we but might not, have a yeah, lot of agreement. But it's not, it's not, it's not just that. I mean, so here's the problem when you, when you have an empirical argument, so then I respond with empirical examples, and every example I give to someone like you who's in favor of IP, they always they always crawfish and they say, oh, well, I'm not in favor of patent term or copyright that lasts 150 years. Oh, I'm not in favor of people going to jail for it. Oh, I'm not in favor of a patent that's silly. Like So they basically, every example you give that's the real world example of how the system works. They back off on it and that you end up with saying, well, the, what in the hell are you in favor of? And they're like, well, I don't know. I'm not an expert. So, <laughs> so what do you do? Yeah, well, <laughs> they, uh, you know, governments obviously could be abusing this or companies, but look, it, it, I haven't seen this study and I don't know. I mean, if there exists one that says that we would have a more vibrant economy with more innovation, more you know, investment in things if nobody could patent anything, right? Here's what, here's what, here, Peter, here's what the studies show. I'll tell you, uh, and I can send you a link and you can look at it. Um, Fritz, Ma you know, Fritz Macklop, right? Kind of a quasi Austrian guy, big shot in the fifties. Congress, can, Fritz yeah. Macklop, um, he's sort of like Habeler and mm -hmm. anyway, you, you'll, if you look up his name, you'll, you'll, you'll probably remember him, but, um, he did a big study for the Congress in the fifties and, uh, with Edith Penrose, and lots of other studies have been done since then. What they conclude every time is that, look, we've looked at the evidence, and as far as we can tell, there is no conclusive evidence that patents do anything positive to the economy. And it looks like they probably distort research and impede innovation. So in other words- but how, do no they, how do they conclude that? I mean, how, do, they have, do they have areas of the world where there are no patents, there are no copyrights? Yeah, I mean, if you look at the book uh, Against Intellectual Monopoly by Bolger and Levine, two economists written about 10 years ago, um, and they started out researching this issue, trying to find evidence for copyright and patent. They, by the end of their book and their research, they concluded that they should all be abolished. Um, so, for example, in, in, the, in, the, in, the in the in the 1900s, for about 50 or 60 years, Switzerland and Italy had no patents for pharmaceuticals, and of course, Italy and Switzerland were two of the biggest pharmaceutical manufacturers in the world. Mm -hmm. So you can give all kinds of examples of counterexamples to the standard argument that they're necessary for innovation. Um, in fact, if you look at all the inventions that won Nobel Prizes and things like that, overwhelming majority didn't benefit from patents, physics innovations, mathematical innovations, things like that. Mm -hmm. There's overwhelming evidence throughout history that people innovate not because of patents. And in fact, the patent system prevents innovation clearly because if I can't sell a smartphone like Apple's, I'm not going to waste time trying to research. And right, but it. if I, I mean, obviously, you know, people can still improve uh, an existing patent and they can no. work with yeah, the you, holder but, and license it and, yeah. you know. Yeah, but you can't, why would you bother improving coming up with iPhone number two if you can't sell it? You're not no, going to no, I could sell it if if I came up with something truly unique, I could go to Apple and 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 license them the improvement to their patent and say, "Hey, I found a better I found something that's really great that's going to improve your phones." It's and I've possible in some that. cases. It's possible in some cases, but it's certainly an an impediment to innovation because and to, to R&D in the first place because that's a hurdle, that's a cost. And you know, Apple's sitting pretty. Apple's one of the richest companies in the world. Why, why are they going to pay attention to Joe Blow coming off the street saying, "Hey, uh, I've got a, an improvement on your right. iPhone. I want you to, uh, I want you to give me permission to make it, and I'll give you permission to add my improvement to your iPhone." They might just say, "Go pound sand," and everyone knows of that risk, so they're not going to invest in the first place. So innovation well, gets well. But what about the fact that even smaller people, um, you have all these big companies. And if I'm going to invest money in coming up with something and a big company like Apple could just steal my patent and just mass produce it and not have to pay me a nickel. I mean, what kind of barrier to innovation is that? You know, because th then the little guy has no power 
when you know some big company can just, oh, that's a great idea. Let's we already have the economies of scale, we have the distribution, we don't have to pay this guy anything to adopt this thing that he can we'll just do it and he's got nothing. So you <laughs> well, know first of all, maybe Apple wouldn't be so big in the first place and such a threat to these guys if they didn't have patents to rest on in the first place. I mean, these oligopolies, these cartels, these quasi monopolies emerge because the patent system is a monopoly grant. It's not a surprise that monopolies get created when the government grant gives people monopolies. I mean, yeah, you know, I mean, that's the only way. Look, I agree. That's the only way you have a lot of people that are worried about monopolies. Look, I want to get rid of all antitrust laws. I, I don't think we should have any of that. I, I don't think the government should be trying to break up companies that they think are too big or they think are monopolized. And, and by, and by the way, the, the, but, the, the courts, when they say that copyright is in, is in tension with the First Amendment, they also say that antitrust law is in tension with the patent law because the antitrust law tries to prohibit monopolies, and yet the government is granting monopolies. So what they say is, well, we're going to give you a monopoly, but you can't abuse it. What the hell does that mean? So you can use it to charge a monopoly price, but don't take it too far. Well, they're giving you a monopoly on a and your invention or you know something like. But you're not. You don't have a monopoly. On. You can you you know you can charge monopoly prices with for, I mean, look at these drugs that how can you charge ten thousand dollars a year for a prescription that takes well I understand know, but the the problem it's a monopoly price right but the problem is that and this is unique to the United States or United States situation but I would like to get rid of the FDA uh, and and let dr companies develop drugs without having yeah. to spend the hundreds and hundreds of millions or billions of dollars that are required for government. So if we didn't have all this government, yes, then you know we would have a lot more innovation. Drug, drug prices would be a well, lot lower. On. But no, but not I mean, only that, not only that, Peter. But you know, people that argue for patents, like the pharmaceuticals, say, well, the the clearest case you need patents for is pharmaceuticals because it's so easy to knock it off, and the cost is so high. Well, the cost is high because of the FDA. And not only that, the FDA process takes so long, and the people that submit these drugs for approval, they're required to publicize all of their details. So by the time they get their FDA approval, all their competitors know how to make it because they were forced to reveal their Yeah, secret. exactly. But my point is that if you leave that in place and then you tell the drug companies, oh, you've got to spend all this money – Right. Complying with all these rules. And you're not going to have any period of time where you can recoup your investment. Right. They won't spend a nickel. Yeah. So, so basically, the argument is that the government has fucked up everything with the FDA. So we need to fuck up innovation by had, adding a patent no, system no. on top of it. It doesn't fuck up the well, it doesn't screw up the innovation because you, you have the FDA. So get rid of the FDA first and then <laughs> talk to me about. Peter, do you realize? Patents. I mean, you know that people have literally died because of patents. Like, um, you know, there are companies that make these drugs that so certain people with rare diseases need, and the drugs are in short supply because only one company can make it. Right? I mean, this there are well, they can stories. generally. Yeah, you know, generally you can find it. You know, you can find it outside the United States somewhere, right? You know, somebody. It's not. This is just not the case all the time. A I lot mean, of times, I, these companies. You know, they will sell the products outside the United States, you know, at a much lower price because they're recouping their investment inside the United States. Do, do you remember? Look, do, look, wait, look, wait, let me I agree, another... but the problem isn't the patent. The problem is the FDA that ran up the cost of producing the drug. Yeah, That's but the, the argument problem. is that the argument is because the government imposes FDA costs on us, we need the government to impose a monopoly patent system to help people recoup the cost that the government has imposed on them in the first place. So the but, answer of the, of the libertarian and the free market guy is let's get rid of both government regimes. Let's get rid of the government <laughs> FDA system and the patent system. Yeah, well, the, the FDA is, 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 is the bigger target. But, you know, if no, it's not. there is it, let's say there's a very rare disease that not that many people suffer from, right? Why are Fabri you going Fabri to- Fabry's disease is a good example. Fabry's right, so disease. why are you going to try to develop a cure for that when there's such a small market, unless you can charge a higher price for the drug because you don't have a big market to sell it into? As opposed to people looking, you know, to cure baldness when you got, you know, everybody going bald, oh, shoot, if I can find a cure for that, yeah, I'll sell it to all these guys. You know, but if you're trying to find some you know, obscure little disease that hardly affects anybody. Okay. 
So, Obviously, so early, okay, the but, price but is going to be have to be higher to incentivize you to try to come up with a, uh, a cure. But you're kind of ad hoc because earlier you kind of implied that if we get rid of the FDA system, then we can maybe tone the patent system down. But now you seem to be saying, well, we need the patent system anyway. No, no, no. I, 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 I'm saying that the reason that drugs are so expensive is because of the FDA. If we had no FDA, the cost of drugs for a disease that hardly anybody gets are going to be more expensive, but not nearly as expensive as they are now because companies won't have to invest all that money in getting them approved. And so not they, only that, not only that, you'd be the first to market. So you could charge a higher than average price for a while because you wouldn't have revealed your secrets to all the competitors. So they wouldn't be able to have knockoff drugs right away. You would have. Yeah, a I mean, obviously they'd have. Yeah. If they'd have to reverse engineer and try to figure out what's in there um, and, and, and how and how to make it. And obviously, too, there is a, you know, a, a value of your brand. So if I'm yeah. a company that people trust, oh, I'll you know, how, how are you going to trust this guy's drugs? I mean, what do you know? How do you know what's in there? You know, you, well, I mean, you trust. My I mean, I don't know about you, but I buy I buy Tylenol from the store, even though it's two or three times as expensive as acetaminophen generic brand sitting right next to it on the mm -hmm. shelf people yeah. will pay more for reputation mm -hmm. yeah which you just said had no value now no i didn't say I, no I, I, no I, <laughs> or that you has, said you can't own it you said you can't own your reputation yeah it has value certainly it has value goodwill has value on, on the balance sheet but that's an economic and finance concept it's not a property rights concept yeah well, I, I so you're, you you just don't think you have even though you you de, you you devote resources and time to building your brand and building that reputation that you don't have any ownership of it. Well, and, I mean, I think if you if you know it's this is capitalism. If you put a lot of time and effort into a business that fails, you, you're not entitled to a profit, right? I mean, you're not. No, entitled I didn't to say I'm entitled to a profit, but if if, if somebody um, lies in order to purposely diminish the value of my property or my, my, you know, my asset and, you know, and they're doing it, you know, to enrich themselves at my expense and they're doing it fraudulently. Yeah, but it's not, uh, I've but, been, but I've been hard. Again, they don't require showing a fraud. It's got nothing. I mean, if I copy your book and sell it, I'm not defrauding anyone. No, I'm you're not. not well, you're not defraud that, that would not be because that's, that's not yeah, defamation. That's just a case of you're copying my, you know, intellectual property and selling it and not yeah. compensating me. I'm not, you know, I mean, I get people all the time, you know, they want to reproduce my books. They want to reproduce them in another country and they'll say, Hey, can I buy the rights to put your book? You know, they contact you and they know you. Okay, sure. What are you going to do? All right. You know, you know, and, and you sell the right and somebody's able to do it. Um, and, and now they're doing it legally, but you know, to, to, to say that, you know, any, anything, that you create is just public po property. The minute you you, you know you, you you make it available to one person, well, the minute you, when you sell say it any, to one person. When you say anything, see this word "thing" is kind of a vague word. I don't think anything that you can conceptually name is an ownable type of thing in the world. I mean, property rights apply to material resources that are scarce, right? That people can have comfort. Well, over. good ideas are scarce. I mean, there's not no, a, that, you know books are scarce. I mean, it's scarce not, in the sense on, that. They're you can reproduce. All right. So, so if everybody, not everybody, is a is a talented author, not everybody. If if you know, you, you we wouldn't have these authors that make so much money. I mean, if anybody could just come up with a book and write it, I mean, fine. But there there is there is not an unlimited amount of creativity, and um, you know, when people no no, but for, 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 but for a given pattern of information, that pattern of information, that knowledge can be shared and spread and copied infinitely without diminishing anyone else's ability to employ that same pattern. It's it basically in economic terms, it's a recipe, right? It's, it's just what guides your action. It's not the scarce resources that you employ to achieve things. Right. It's but, you know, if, 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 if somebody spends their time building a thing, right, I, I, I devote, you know, my time and I'm building something with my hands and I've created something. You're with, saying, with, okay, that's with, property with, with, that you own resources. and nobody could take it because with, there's only one of them. But, but if I'm, never, on the other hand, if I devote my time to creating something intellectual, I, I, I spend my mental energy, you know, you know, thinking and, and writing and creating something 
that somehow I don't own that. That that's you, you know, that's f fair because, game because, for the world. Because your your first example, look, I mean, you do see the similarities between your your argument and say Marxism, because Marx says this labor theory of value, right? The more when the workers put their labor into building a car on the assembly line. And when Ford sells it at a profit, he's exploiting them by taking. No, the I, that, that that that's got nothing to do with it. I mean, what you're saying is more Marxist. You're saying that things that are created should be owned collectively by society at large. That when anything that one person develops should be shared equally with everybody. That the person who invented it no. or created it has no more rights to it than anybody else. That's what you're saying. Well, the, you have the right to keep information secret, and then people can't use it. But if you but make yeah, but what good is if I write a book and keep it secret and nobody can read it? Then what's the point of writing it if nobody well, can read it? People write books all the time for lots of reasons. I mean, for no, but they write books to so that they'll be read, not to hide them in secret. Yeah, and most people don't write books to make money anyway. You know oh, that. sure they do. You think most authors don't want to get paid? How do they yeah. eat? Yes, I, I don't, do. I don't I think mean, most authors make any money at all. Well, they, they, <laughs> well, people write songs, they write screenplays. I mean, there's all sorts of people. How much? How much? There are how professional much did, writers. How much did Aristotle make for writing his books? How much? How much did? Uh, did well, did, you can't. You know, I mean, you know, they they, they got the favor of uh, the the king or whatever. I don't know what their the systems were. Well, but, I mean, are you being paid for this bit, for this podcast right now? It's the same. I mean, do, when you write a blog post, do you get paid for it? Well, no. You know, but, okay. you know, but I, I also don't care if people copy it either. But I, you know, I mean, it's, it's a, most people but, don't care. If pe most people want to be not obscure. They want people to read their stuff. But and that's, they don't but that's put the right of the author. Look, if I want to put something into the public domain and just let anybody copy it, that's my right. But if I want to sell it and I want to restrict the rights of other people to sell what I just created, I should be able to do that. Because it's I, I'm the one that, that created it. You want to write? Look, I'm not limiting your ability. Anybody can write a book. Just don't write my book, right? So if I write a book and you want to sell books, fine. Write one. Sell you're it. I'm limiting, not stopping you're, you. You're, you're limiting what they can do with their own property. Like if I own. No, no, no. I, you can write whatever you can think of. You can come no. up with whatever you want. I'm not stopping you. I, I can't write a sequel to to, uh, to Raiders of the Lost Ark right now and publish it. I can't. Well, write not that. if you want to use those characters' names. You Why know, not? If you want to, What's wrong? Because they're who's, all, who's come who's up with your I... own. Come up with your own characters. Why? Don't use what? somebody else's. <laughs> what, what if I don't want? What if I want to write a sequel to Catcher in the Rye or a sequel to Atlas Shrugged? Well, that What's that one might. That? I'm not sure if you know how long ago that one was written, but I mean, look. Obviously, though, uh, you I am. can write. Don't try to profit off of somebody else's work. Do come up with your own book. Come up but with your like own characters. That's like saying Who's like stopping some, you? that's like saying McDonald's comes up with a fast food restaurant for hamburgers and Burger King does it, and you say, "Look, don't eat into my business. Why don't you come up with a different restaurant?" No, no, sell, I, they, sell McDonald's. McDonald's was not able to con patent the concept of you know a fast food. But it, I'm making, but I'm making a general. That's not enough of point. a difference. You can't patent uh, enough, that. Enough, enough. Well, so you're going to trust these incompetent government <laughs> bureaucrats to to make a nuanced de decision Look, about know, what's enough. I don't know. You know, I, I have no idea. Is it? Would I be willing to concede that it is possible that we would actually be better off without uh, these rules? I mean, is it possible? Maybe. I I don't know. It does. It, 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 you know, intuitively, it isn't obvious that we would be better. But if you want to look at all of the excess government that we have, that is so obviously destructive to individual liberty and our collective prosperity, there are so many things that are higher up on that totem pole okay, than so IP and defamation and stuff let, like let, that. Well, and I, I think I that you know, when you start to argue about getting rid of that stuff, you, you, you now you, you start losing the argument about all the other stuff that we okay, should get rid of first. That is, I, is so much worse. You know, you, you go. That's like when people when people are uh, looking for anarchy, when you're trying to go to somebody who believes in big government and you come to them and say, I want no government at all. I want anarchy. Yeah, 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 you yeah. try to get somebody from here yeah. to here. It's very hard. So no, if you I, just say, look, I don't want to get rid of all government. I just want to get rid of most of it. And yeah, here are the, the things the big, that government go doesn't need targets. to do. You know? Okay, but hear, hear me out for a second. I would agree with you on defamation law. It's not that huge of a problem. Although 
it is the reason for the CDA and the Section 230 exemption, which they're threatening to take away from companies now to restrict these liberal tech companies. But so it's threatening internet freedom, which is a bad thing. But um, I, I would argue that the patent system itself is a much bigger problem than, than you think it is. And I would put it up near the top of all the evil things the government does up there with war and the drug war and the tax system and the Federal Reserve. I would well, put you, it maybe right. near the As top. As a patent lawyer, I mean, you clearly are in a position to be more familiar with that than I am. And I would concede right off the bat that there could be a lot of abuses to that system. And there but may it's, be it's, a lot of things that are being granted patents that really should not be patentable. But that they are but not a but, but significant even, even, enough innovation that it would warrant, you know, exclusion and, and some kind of monopoly interest. But that's not. So the primary argument is this, that maybe you would see see my way on this. Why are we wealthier now than we were 500 years ago? Is it because the earth we found more more value? No, it's because of innovation and capital investment and, right. you know, free markets and the right. way we were able to improve our productivity. Right. And now we can produce a lot more stuff so, right. than we could so, in the so, past. And so we don't have to work as hard to right. produce it. So what's key to human progress and development and prosperity is the ever growing accumulation of intellectual capital, right? It's, it's, the, it's the knowledge that we develop over the ages. It's learning more and more and more and more about how the world works, causal laws, right? And you and I and everyone living today benefits from all the knowledge that we are standing on the shoulders of people from past generations, mm -hmm. right? Anything that impedes that accumulation of technological knowledge is dangerous to human life, literally kills people and prevents people from uh, from machines and designs and productivity gains and food and agriculture and pharmaceuticals mm -hmm. that they otherwise would have. So if we got the balance wrong and the patent system does impede innovation, which I believe it certainly does, then it is costing us untold prosperity in human life. And it, it, we should do everything we can to unleash the innovative spirit and to let people innovate, tinker, compete, learn from each other, and build on other people's ideas. Right, but that's, that's, you're talking about if that is the case. And again, I haven't even seen the evidence that would suggest to me that a patents, a system of patents recognizing somebody's ownership interest in their innovation, their, you know, what they've created, but but that, don't, that don't is either. somehow, because remember, the, the economic purpose of it, other than saying that intellectual property is property, is that it is incentivizing people to devote resources to developing new innovations and it's, and because it's they are protected for a limited time to be able to recoup both the costs of the time and the money they put into the development process and to be sufficiently rewarded for taking the risk. Because, you know, I can spend a lot of time trying to come up with a new invention and it doesn't work. Nobody likes it. It doesn't do what I thought it was going to do. And I get nothing. So there is a lot of risk to devoting yeah. your resources uh, to trying to come up with something. And you have no idea if it's going to work or not. In fact, you know, when you talk about drugs, you know, far more drugs never get yeah. approved than do get approved. And so the ones that get approved the drug companies have to make enough money to cover all the costs of the ones that went nowhere, where they spent yeah. all sorts of money and they didn't work. Uh, and so the, the, the argument is that these protections are actually encouraging and enabling innovation. And in but, fact, one of the things that happens, you know, when people are looking uh, for uh, investors in a new process, I mean, I don't know if you ever watched Shark Tank, you know, yeah. But yep. one of the first things they ever ask the guys that have some because you got what patents you got. I mean, before yeah, they I, the, before I they know. want to invest in it, they want to know if this is patented, because if it's not, they don't want to risk money. They don't, that you well, can't raise money unless you can prove that you've got some kind of proprietary deal there. Well, Peter, uh, I help so, people. I help people obtain patents because that's the system we have. And given that we have the system. You need to do it. You need to play the game. And investors are going to want to know that you have your all your IP uh, taken advantage of, too. So, But that doesn't justify the system existing in the first place. It just means you have to manip 
I mean, listen. Well, my point you, is it might be harder to get investors to fund your research if they don't are if they're not confident that they're going to be able to recoup their investment because if you end up, you know, with this new product that you're going to have some type of ability to exclude your competitors from knocking okay. you off. Otherwise, you know, how am I going to get my money back if all these big companies can just immediately knock off exactly what you've made and they've spent no money on research and development, but they already have all the distribution uh, and they could just, you know, start producing it and we're not going to get a return on our investment. So why should we well, give I you mean, the money to fund you your realize development? Everything you're saying applies to entrepreneurship in general. If you come up with a new venture, you're taking a risk that it might not succeed and you might have competition that might make it hard to make a profit, et cetera. People always take risks when they come up with a new venture. But I mean, you realize that you can't say, I don't know what the studies have proved, but this is definitely an intrusion into the free market. It's a limited monopoly that is a, a, de a deviation from the free market. It seems like the burden of proof would be on you guys to show that it does improve innovation and welfare. And I'm telling you, I will send you the studies. There have never been a single empirical careful study yeah, well, done for some reason the framers of the constitution thought that it that that it helped no but they, do you think do you think they did an empirical study and proved it well they they, they based it on something <laughs> okay well i'll tell you what they based it on they based it upon uh the statute of monopolies in 1623 in england which was the attempt of the parliament to rein in the abuses of the monarch granting monopolies to their cronies and they said this is getting out of hand you're giving a monopolies left and right to all your your court favorites who help you collect taxes, like this guy can sell sheepskin in this town, this guy can sell playing cards in this town, you know, all these monopolies, which are definitely uh, mercantilist and anti-free market. And the parliament got fed up with it and they said, we're gonna stop all this, but you can still keep doing it for inventions. And so when the Congress in the US, when the constitution was ratified, they, they, they said, well, let's, let's keep alive the ability to grant these patents and they picked 17 years, well, 14, 14 years for the copyright and 14, 17 years for the patent. The reason they picked that number was because they figured, well, when you have an apprentice studying under you, they usually do two seven-year terms, 14 right. years. So you need, you need to have a monopoly for 14 years on your copyright and your patents to protect you from competition by your apprentices when they, when they leave your employment. It was totally... <laughs> totally protectionist and arbitrary and and then they've expanded the copyright number over the years up to 150 years or something now it's insane yeah well it's it's i think it's the life of the author plus yeah a, which works out to about 120 30 years in most cases yeah look i mean look i i would say that you know that you know they don't have to be that long it doesn't take you know that long to to to, to let somebody recoup the, uh, the, you know, the, the costs involved in, in, in writing something. So, you know, th th there could be an, a disagreement over how long those protections should, ba should, should be there. But well, look, well, uh, uh, you know, well, let me ask you one more question. If you're, if you're a constitutionalist, the, 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 the copyright clause says that Congress can pass these limited monopolies for limited, for limited times to protect the writings of authors. Now that's been expanded to cover software, and movies and audio recordings. Yeah, Dude, well, those... that's because I think, well, look, that stuff didn't exist at the time. Yeah, and so still, I but... think you can, when you try to, I, I mean, obviously, I mean, I'm an original intent guy. I don't want to ignore the constitution. So look, the US government has the authority to have uh, a Navy and an army. They didn't mention the Air Force. Well, of course, because there were no planes. So you have to think, well, given the fact that they allowed the government to have a navy and an army had airplanes existed back then would they have said an air force and you'd say sure that makes sense because they're trying to enable the best defense possible and that was what was available at the well, time well, but, but, so, well the constitution could be amended too peter and but so now, I, but for that i don't think you have to amend it because i think you're just dealing with what were they trying to do and I well, think, look, they didn't have movies, they didn't have software, they didn't have ra radio recordings, uh, they didn't have, none of that existed, but they, they were protecting they had, what existed at the time. They had boat hole designs, and that's in the copyright law now, and boat holes were around in, in 1789. Hmm. But well, the design of a hole? Well, I don't think, they, well, they didn't specify, they, you know, what was... Uh, 
what but a bone hole design is not a writing i mean it's a writing is something you write down it's it's words on paper well it's on it, it was on paper back then now it doesn't have to be on paper it can be on, on software you know it, but a, mo it a be... movie a movie and an audio recording and soft is it, they're not writings but yes a paint a paint there were paintings paintings weren't covered paintings are not writings what would it paintings there were paintings in 1789 yes they, I know they were, were not they were not covered by the original copyright act and they were not contemplated by writings i mean the point well, so, is well, yeah but yeah so you're, you're what you're saying is somebody could could paint somebody else's painting yeah yeah but it, then it, you know it's not going to be identical because you're you know you're you're not you're just you're also having to paint it yourself you're having to yeah you're, yeah you're, but, but the copyright law you don't have to be identical to violate copyright law it could be substantially similar or a, mm -hmm. or it could be a derivative work so you can't you can't make a painting by hand even now of someone else's painting that's a copyright violation but they didn't consider it a copyright violation no it was ma maps maps charts and books hmm. so when, when well when did they change it later decades later maybe a century later i mean mm -hmm. this stuff started getting worse with the burn convention in the in the 1900s uh it's just at least we could go back to what tom bell calls the founder's copyright let's go back to 14 year terms renewable once and you have to register it it's not automatic like it is now yeah i mean i i mean you i would definitely agree with you that a simpler system that you know didn't apply you know, as broadly as it does to the things that clearly um, are benefiting. Because look, if I'm a famous painter and people want my paintings, right? Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're gonna want somebody else who happened to paint something that looks similar to my painting if I didn't paint it myself. Now, what should be illegal, and would you agree with this? Let's say I am an artist and somebody else copies my painting and forges my signature on the bottom and sells it and represents it as if I did it and says, um, this think, is a Peter think, Schiff original painting. I think and they're the assuming I was a, I was a you know, talented painter that had a, a clientele. If somebody is going to make a painting and pretend that I painted it and try to sell it to somebody as if it was one of mine, do you think that should be illegal? I think, I think theoretically, uh, potentially that's a case of fraud on the consumer. And that's already. But it's also fraud. fraud on me because no, it's not. No, it's not. But Just I have. A, I own the market in Peter Schiff originals. No, you don't. You don't own a market. This is this whole. In, in my original work, I do. How could you say that? That you don't I don't own, own the market on my you don't original. Own a, what does that mean to own a market? That's a metaphorical. No, that's well, not it's. Part of, well, look, it's you not, know, it's if some if 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 somebody is going to say yes, this is an original work created by Peter Schiff, you know. That's well, you, only you, I can asked, do that. If you want, if you want to say, look, Peter Schiff made a painting, and I and I painted something that looks very similar to it, and it's well, by me. That's one thing. But it, let, let, let me let, let me give you two examples of that, of that case. So, let's suppose I want to impress my friends by by saying I have a Picasso. So I hire an artist. To <laughs> fake, I hire an artist to do a fake Picasso for me. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I see what you're I, saying. Look, if I buy a fake on purpose, I'm not defrauded. Like if I buy a fake Rolex for twenty dollars in New York, there's no fraud. No, no. Right. Because, you know, it's not a real Rolex. But but I would also say, though, that, you know, copying the design of a Rolex, if you make a watch that looks like a Rolex, yeah. Right, but if you actually write the word Rolex in it and you spell it correctly and you do it for the purpose of deceiving somebody, then that should be a violation. But if I you agree. just make the same style, you make yeah. it look the same, um, you know, but of course it's not going to be the same. It's not going to let it's going to break after a couple of weeks. That's the problem no, but, with those, but, but, with those but, fake so, Rolexes. So I would say that if you make let's say you make a ten thousand dollar fake rolex and it's really good and it's it's a copy that almost no one can tell the difference as long as you don't deceive the customer i think that should be legal well and as long as you don't is it shouldn't have the rolex you know cop patented uh, no. logo on it i have no problem with it i think you can have the rolex logo on it if you want to as long as you don't 
lie to your customer, then you're not committing fraud on that customer. I, mean, I know, but I think, I think that, so you're saying that nobody even has a right to their own trademark. That yeah, anybody. That, that's, that's just like, it's like a right to a reputation. You don't have a right to a reputation. See, I, I would disagree because I do think, look, if I can create a brand where there is some status surrounding I know it has value. Brand. I agree it has value economically. I agree. And, and so not everybody can just take a Nike swoosh and put it on their tennis sneakers. I disagree. You, know, you can you can put you can put something on your tennis sneakers. It can't be exactly what Nike has patented. Because I think it what can you're be. trying to do is you're trying to profit off of the marketing efforts of somebody else. So, you know, um, but in your example of the painting, you know, if I am going to buy a painting, um, just to pretend that it's, you know, a, a Picasso, that's different than the guy actually selling it and saying, yeah, this is a Picasso. I'm going to sell it to you cheap. That should, that should be prohibited. I agree with you. We right. Agree but, on that. you know, but that's pure fraud. And that's a fraud on the customer, not on the, not on someone else, not on third party. But it's a fraud on, uh, on, on well, obviously Picasso was dead. So it's, you know, so, and nobody owns the right. Uh, but obviously, you know, other people, I guess, own legitimate Picassos. Um, but yeah, I mean, there are going to be authentic people that, I mean, that, at that point it's, you know, you're just going to try to sell your, your Picasso and you're going to find out you bought a fraud because somebody's going to try to verify it. See, and Peter, that's why we need, we need Bitcoin because you can put the proof in the blockchain. What does no Bitcoin can, have to do with it? I'm joking, but you know, people say that you could put information in the blockchain to prove your authorship and so it's a joke i mean yeah, yeah, i don't yeah. agree with that yeah all right but anyway look i look i get your points and you know you know it's i'm not even saying that you know it, it would be impossible <laughs> for you to convince me although i don't know maybe if we talk long enough i might get you to see the perspective of patent but you've obviously thought a lot about it being the fact that that's what you do for a living and yeah, you've let, experienced let, it let, in yeah. real time and, and you've seen a lot of the the negatives of it. I mean, I mean, maybe you've seen some of the positives. I don't know. I mean, I don't, it can't be all one sided where I have never seen a, a single positive from it ever in my whole career. Well, um, who are you representing in your practice? Are you representing the, the companies that are defending their patents? Are you representing the guys that are trying to get patents? So I don't, I don't do a lot of litigation. So I help them obtain patents and primarily they obtain the patents to, to have them in their war chest for defensive reasons. So like, a large tech company or a mid-sized tech company has patents, they don't usually use them. They just sit there and they, they serve as a warning to other competitors not to sue them because if you sue me, I'll counter sue you back. So it's, it's like an insurance policy. It's like, it's a defensive measure. Mm -hmm. So it's, but it's a waste because if there weren't patents in the first place, they wouldn't need this defense. So it's like my salary and all these patent lawyers, it's just a, it's a dead weight on the economy. It's like a tax. It's a tax on in, in the price. It makes prices go up and it well, reduces innovation. I know. Look, we had a very vibrant economy in the United States, you know, in the, the latter part of the 19th century and even the early part of the 20th century. I mean, we had a booming economy and we had patent laws and copyright laws. You know, we had the Industrial Revolution. We had tremendous innovation and invention that was going on in 1880s, 1890s, 1900, 1910. Right. And we had patents. We had cop So it didn't inhibit the whole it did. industrial it did. revolution. It did inhibit it. Now, are you saying that it would have been even bigger without them? Yes. I mean, but yes. I, I mean, but is there a way to prove that? No. The counterfactual, because no. it was tremendous. I mean, I mean, remember, who was who was the famous head of the patent that was like, oh, there's so many patents now that, we, that I can't imagine anything else being invented. Like everything that uh, could possibly yeah, be invented I forgot his name, has been but... invented. Because well, that's how know, many I, patents there were. So, <laughs> ironically, Thomas Jefferson was the first commissioner of the patent office, and Thomas Jefferson himself wrote a lot of things against the patent system. He said, like, you know, if I have a candle or a taper, he called it, and you light your taper off of mine, now we both have the flame. So you don't diminish my light by lighting your candle off of my candle. And he was using that to say that there shouldn't be property rights and ideas because they're like the flame. But then he was the first commissioner of the patent office because he was such an innovator himself. Congress didn't know who to yeah. appoint to it. <laughs> but yeah, look, I think I look, I think there's arguments on both sides as to which, you know, yeah, and, and again, the the compromise is to have limited life for how long you grant it 
and to have more, a, a, a more strict determination as to what actually would constitute something that was innovative enough and new enough that it was warranted of a patent. Well, the, you know? the problem, even there are lots of people that grant the theoretical case for patents like you, but even they can see that, listen, in the real world, our only choice is to have a very clunky, inefficient patent system or to have no patent system. And between those two alternatives, no patents is better than what we have because the ideal one that they, they dream up in their heads is impossible. It'd be like well, saying, let's I mean, look, I, I don't know. Maybe you're, maybe that's correct. Again, I haven't seen the data, but then, you know, you have two separate um, things that we're considering. One is what is best for society as far as what will lead to the greatest amount of innovation and economic growth and shared prosperity, right? What, what is good economics? And then just the moral case of what is private property. Yeah. You, know, d you know, even if having no patents turns out to be better economically than having patents, does that make it right morally to say that somebody who uh, creates something does not own their creation. They don't I, I, own, you know, I, and, and so that's a different argument. I, I would say that if you, know. you if you if you take as a baseline a private property system with competition and with freedom to copy and emulate people, if you want to deviate from that and introduce this temporary limited restriction on the free market, then the burden of proof is on you to come up with a study showing that it does improve everyone's welfare. And no one has done that. They haven't been able to do it. They didn't even try for like 70 years. But it's not really, is it really a infringement on the free market? Getting back to the case of a writer and, all, you know, I'm writing a, a book. Um, and I don't prohibit anybody else from writing anything. I mean, anybody in the world is free to write a book. I can't well, if, stop anybody from writing if, a if, book. If, if, if I'm just saying if, that if I develop my own book and my own characters, right, my own I create the characters, I create this, 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 this fictional world that you just can't write the same characters or you, know, you can't just copy the same book or just take my characters that I develop and, and incorporate them into whatever you're doing, that you have to come up with something on your own to compete with me. You, can't, well, you just can't take what I've developed and compete. You gotta, you gotta, you gotta come up with your own uh, creation and then compete well, against me with that. Tell people, hey, I've got a better story. I've got better characters. Yeah, it's but, more but, interesting. But again, it's <laughs> that's like saying I have a hamburger restaurant. You need to come up with something different than a hamburger restaurant. I mean, no, no. Or, I or mean, put, put, it, no, put it this way. Put it this. Put it. Th put it this way. Um, if you don't think it's an infringement or an impingement on the free market, why do you want to limit it to limited? T why doesn't it last forever? Why don't you have copyright last forever? Why do you well, want to cut it off after a certain point in time if you don't think it at some point infringes on the free market and people's freedom? Yeah, well, I mean, the question is, um, after a certain amount of time, and you would think, you know, that something making, has been in the public domain for a certain amount of time that, you know, it, it, that, that, that you, you no longer need that. As to yeah, say, but, well, but, that, but that's not your moral. Yeah. Your I, get, moral I get what you're saying. I mean, you're yeah. saying that, well, if... I mean, if I own a chair, I own that chair forever. And if yes. I leave it to my, if I will it to my kid and he wills it to his kid, it can stay in our family for time immemorial. Yes. And you're saying, why should I make a distinction between that type of property and an intellectual property? Like, it's yeah, because I, you I get what you're saying. You, and, recognize you, know, that you recognize that it is a deviation from the free market and you don't want it to go too far or too long but you're willing to put up with it for a while. So it, it is a deviation from the free market. It's not a natural right. It's definitely not. A, the found, Locke didn't think it was a natural right. Jefferson and the founders did not think it was a natural right. They thought it was well, a they, limited- But they wrote it into the constitution. Well, they wrote lots of things in the constitution that are not natural rights. Well, they didn't give, I mean, they didn't give the federal government very many powers, right? The, the constitution uh, enumerates, uh, you know, very few powers to the federal government. <laughs> and one of those few powers that is enumerated is issuing patents. So it's one of the few well, things that they actually wanted the federal government to do. Well, Peter, they didn't want the federal government to do very much. 
Who wrote the Constitution? It was the guys that were the writers. Matt, well, Madison is the father of it, but I mean. Yeah, but th these are the writers. These are guys that wrote books. These are the guys that did inventions <laughs> like Jefferson. Of course, they're going to put in something that's going to benefit them. Well, Ben Franklin was there too, right? So. Of course, he was an, another prolific inventor. But I mean, so of course, they're going to put that provision in there. But they didn't know. Listen, let me just suggest one thing. I'm going to send you a link. The one thing you should read on this, if you're interested, I'll give you some, some snapshot studies. But really the best book on this from your point of view is the book against intellectual monopoly by Bolger and Levine. It's a free, they're free market economists. They've studied it both copyright and patent from almost every angle. And it's just unbelievable what they, how they debunk all these myths about pharmaceuticals and the light bulb and copyright and everything. So there is a, a good empirical case for deep, deep skepticism about copyright and patent doing anything positive on net for society. And, and I would be willing to concede that based on the way the system has evolved or maybe devolved, depending on your perspective, over the years, that we've gone to the point where it could have gone from doing good to doing harm. And yeah. that is generally the case you know, with a lot of government I intervention, yeah. that it can initially do some good. But then after time, it ends up doing a lot of harm. And that may be the case. I mean, you're trying to argue that it never did good, that even from the very beginning, uh, it was a negative. It's just that it's now an even bigger negative. Yeah. And I don't know. I mean, maybe you're right on that. Or maybe, uh, you know, it's just gone from being a good thing to a bad thing because of the way the system has been abused by government and the people who are rent seeking from government. I mean, clearly yeah. I can see companies, yes, every company wants to be a monopoly. I mean, people want to charge higher prices. Nobody wants competition. And to the extent that government can protect you from competition and grant you monopoly pricing, everybody's going to want that. Um, Except, you know, but, you know, one, 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 one exception to that, like Tesla, about I don't know, seven, eight years ago, Elon Musk announced that all their patents they're licensing to the whole world and anyone's free to use them. Now he wanted that because he wanted competition because he wanted the electric car industry to mature. So he would be, a, you know, a big slice of a huge pond rather than a huge slice of a tiny pond. Right. Mm -hmm. So sometimes people invite competition because they want their market to become dominant. Well, that should be their choice, right? I mean, you invent something, you can choose to give away your invention or you can choose to keep it for yourself and sell it, right? I mean, that's part of your own uh, property and you decide how best you want it used. Well, I, um, and I would say that by selling something in the market it reveals your, your design, you're giving it away. It's like Benjamin Tucker, you know, the famous uh, classical liberal anarchist from the 1800s. He, he said, like, if you want to keep your invention to yourself, keep it to yourself. So, if, yeah, but well, if you reveal <laughs> if, you, if you reveal knowledge to the world, you can't complain if other people compete with you. I mean, trade secret law was what people relied upon before the modern patent system. Like, if you well, you know, here's the thing: if if those, I would agree with you. If there is no patent law, if there is no trade secrets or any of that copyright, and then people want to invent something and share it with people, then they know the deal. They know going in. Yeah. I can invent something, but you know, I, I, there's no way I'm, I, I know that I'm going to profit from it. I mean, if you want, they want to do that, but you can't change the rules of the game, you know, <laughs> in well, the middle we can of the game. Them. We can change them at some point. We're not stuck with a bad system. Forever. No, no, no. You can change them proactively. You could perspective, say perspective, going perspective forward, like right? Yeah. You could say going forward, there's no more patents. I'd so be fine anything with that. that you invent, I, I would, I'd be fine with that. Let's, let's, yeah. let's all patents that exist now, they can, they can terminate in 17 years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Forward, we're going to have free market finally. Otherwise, yeah. you're depriving somebody of property without due process, without compensation. But if you want to run an experiment, because that's an easy experiment to run, just get rid of patents. Let's go without any new patents for the next 10 years, 15 years, and then we can see how we did. Well, you know, we're running and then because then we can always put them back if, if, if well, innovation collapses sure. and nobody is willing to do anything. Well, we're running the experiment with copyrights right now because you I mean, I'm sure you're aware that copyright doesn't work anymore. There's the Internet and there's encryption. Well, yeah, there, I know. Look, I, and look, I you know, the copyright laws, you know, are they in effect in China? No, I mean, I'm you know, I mean, you know, you get all not kinds of stuff here. That's, yeah. Dude, I can get I can yeah. get all your books right now for free from b okcc right now yeah now and, and and the thing is for me i'm fine with that i barely made any money you know off no, my but, books that 
But my <laughs> even point though is, they were New York Times bestsellers. But, but my point is, right now we live in a world where there's effectively no copyright enforcement, and we still have a proliferation of artistic and creative works. I mean, do we have a shortage of books right now in the face of mm -hmm. rampant piracy? Do you think we have a shortage of books? There's like ten million well, at least, books published. Right, every but you're year. but 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 at least there's some protection. I mean, you're saying that if we had none whatsoever, think it would be well, just as vibrant. We, we have we have no protection right now. We, I mean, the, there's piracy is rampant. Movies are still made. Music is still made. And books are still written, even though people around the world copy them by the billions. Mm -hmm. So we're doing the experiment already. And my hope is that we will do the experiment with patents when 3D printing becomes mature. And, and just like the Internet is helping people to evade copyright law, um, 3D printing will allow people to evade patent law because you can just make whatever you want without permission in your yeah, did was it were you, the, were you the guy that told me that one of the reasons that the movie industry was developing out in California was because they wanted to avoid uh, Edison's patents? And they, yes. They, 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 and so they wouldn't know what was going on 3,000 miles away? Yeah, well, because the, the court system was different back then. So, yeah, they were doing it partly to, to evade uh, copyright and, or patent lawsuits. Yeah, yeah, it's but, crazy. Uh, it's crazy what, what patents have done to the world. But um, anyway, I'll let you go. I appreciate your time unless you have yeah. any more questions. Yeah, yeah, hopefully my son doesn't still think I'm a socialist just because I har harbor some of these rules. <laughs> these these I, I, old fashioned thinking of uh, of patents and copyrights and, and defamation is particularly uh, close to my heart, having just recently been defamed so badly by the Australian media. And all the problems that that has caused me has caused me a lot of problems, a lot of financial losses. Uh, you well, know. let me ask you this on the defamation front. I mean, you, you realize that defamation law is much harder to defamation suits are much harder to prove in the U.S. because of our strong First Amendment as opposed yeah, yeah, to like I in, haven't. In I, I definitely look, I definitely have a very good case in in Australia and I would yeah. probably win. Uh, and I'm still trying to consider whether or not I want to bring it. The problem is the, the cost of bringing it is extremely high, and I have to cover their law, law, law legal bills as well as my own in real time. So but, I have but to my pay. question is, but would you want the U.S. defamation law to be liberalized to be more like it is in the U.K. and Australia so it's easier to bring a defamation suit at the expense of First Amendment rights? Would you want well, our system to be easier? I, look, I, I, I think if... The, the difference here is it's supposedly malice. I mean, did you have a reasonable basis to believe something was true? And, 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 and if you can, if you had some basis for it, you know. No, it's, I'm, I'm, it's like the burden of proof is easier for the, for the plaintiff in non-U.S. In the U.S., it's really difficult to win a defamation lawsuit, which it should be, I believe, because it's a bad law. And it does mm -hmm. conflict with the First Amendment, freedom of speech. Well, I think I know there's a higher standard, you know, for a public figure uh, than for, you know, just a, a run of the mill individual. Um, as yeah, far but as my malice question is, is concerned. So, but would, but would, I'm you, not, want, look, would I, you want to strengthen defamation law in the U.S. to make it I don't more know. Like I don't you? know enough about the information, the defamation statutes uh, to really know whether or not I think our laws are better i know that in australia they're thinking about liberalizing there so that they have fewer lawsuits i mean that's something that they're talking about right um but even then even even with the fact that it's easier right i still have to come up front and pay all the costs of uh their legal bills and my own legal bills and then the damage awards that I can get are still very limited to, you know, what are the economic damages that you can actually prove, you know, and, and I have to prove that the damages relate specifically to what they said. And so it's still not that easy. You know, it's like, okay, you lied about me and you said things that weren't true. And now I have some damages. Well, is it, can I actually prove that, but for those lies, I wouldn't have these damages. And was there any truth to those lies that they could say, well, it wasn't the lie that caused the damage. It was this one little piece of thing. It's the one thing that we got right that caused the damages, not the, the 10 things we got wrong. I don't know. So it's not an open and shut slam dunk. I mean, these are still difficult cases to win and they're very expensive. And in the meantime, you know, what they threaten to do is, oh, well, if you're going to sue us, then we're going to put out more 
uh, de defamatory information about you, and we're really going to turn up the heat on you uh, over the next two years while this lawsuit is going through the court system. And so then they threaten to make it even worse for you when it's like, hey, if you just let it slide, you know, we'll be quiet and we won't, we won't, we won't, we you know, hope maybe the damage will go away, right? We'll, we'll shut up, you know? So, you know, it's still, a, it's not a slam dunk, even in cases where uh, it, it's easier on, on the plaintiff. All right. Well, I'll let you go. Thanks for your time. Right. And um, <laughs> I don't think you're a socialist. You, you have, the, you have your, uh, you're aiming in the right direction. I just think you don't. Yeah. You don't understand the the, the yeah. horrible damage that patent system does, but uh, yeah. You know. And as I said, maybe may, maybe at this stage, it's doing more harm than good. I mean, I'm always open to that idea, and that's just government. I mean, government corrupts everything it gets involved in, and so maybe the case against patents is they're granted by government, and since we can't trust government to to do anything right over time, that maybe it's better not to even have it, uh, rather than turn it over to the government. But, you know. All right. Well, have a good All one right. in Puerto Rico. Take care. And, uh, talk to you later. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.